And so today we're looking at the B and the ABCs of financial freedom. And today we're talking about the term bondage. We're talking about this idea of being in bondage and being in debt and what the scriptures have to tell us about bondage and about debt. And so one of the things that I know so much about our society is that we kind of live in this debt-obsessed society. We live in a society that has become obsessed with being in bondage and being obsessed with being in debt. It's not that we necessarily want it, but it's just become the norm for us. So watch your mail over the course of the next six weeks and just set aside the, the amount of credit card offers that you get in the mail, right? You just set them to the side. If you just looked at them, you probably would have a stack that would look like this of just credit card offers for new credit cards. And you even get credit card offers from the same company that you may have a credit card with. Like I already have one credit card with you. Why do I need another one, right? And so you just, we are in, we have become in a society that most of us have just accepted this idea that I'm supposed to be in debt, that I'm supposed to be in bondage, I'm supposed to have credit cards, I'm supposed to have a car payment, I'm supposed to have all these things, and we have just kind of became in this idea that we believe that this is just the norm for us. But I believe, and we believe as a church, that the Bible is crystal clear of what God's will is for our lives in this area. That for most of us, or for those of us that are followers of Jesus, God's will for our lives is that we wouldn't live, under the, wouldn't live under the bondage or the slavery of debt long term. I mean, I, I truly believe that. I mean, we're going to look at it in a little bit. I mean, some debt at some point may be necessary, but in a long-term picture of things, we're not looking, God doesn't want us in debt for the long, for the long, for the long haul. But the reason why so many of us don't like talking about money is because we're living under the stress and the pressure of financial debt. I told you guys last week, right, that if we could get together, we could go to coffee, we could go to lunch, we could go hang out, I could come to your house to visit, I could do all of that, and you would let me into certain aspects of your life, but the second that we began to talk about your finances, it would get a little bit uncomfortable, we began to talk about how you manage your money or, or what you do with your money or what does that look like or whatever. Like it, it, everything is on the table for the most part with most people except for our finances. And when we get financials, when we talk about finances, it gets a little bit uncomfortable for people. And part of the reason why I believe it's so uncomfortable for some people is be, because we're under this stress and this pressure of financial debt we're embarrassed by our situation. We're embarrassed by what we have. We're, maybe we know we're not as good at managing our money as we should, and so we don't really want to talk about it, even if God was to put someone in our life who was really good with money and who could help us. We just don't really want to talk about our situation. Like, well, I just don't want them to know about that side of me or the side of our family. But when you look in the Scriptures, and you don't have to turn there. It'll be on the screens. You can write it down later. But Proverbs 22.7 Proverbs 22, 7 says this. It says, The rich rules over the poor, and the borrower is the slave of the lender. The rich rules over the poor, and the borrower is the slave of the lender. When you break down the word rules or rule in this scripture, it means to have dominion over. It means to, to reign over. So if you take that term and you change the word rule to dominion over or to reign over, it kind of takes a whole different turn, a whole different spin on what this scripture or what this verse is telling us. The rich have dominion over the poor. The rich have, they reign over the poor. And the borrower is the slave to the lender or of the lender. And so we get this powerful picture in the scripture that we're going to look at today. That we get to see what it looks like when we are in debt to others, when we are a slave to others, how, it, how, how that happens and what happens in our life. And so many of you, and we're going to be in the book of Exodus today, if you guys want to turn there to Exodus chapter 1. But as you're turning there, I want to set this up for you today. Many of you may be familiar with the story of Joseph. Many of you may have never heard of Joseph before, so either way, I just want to set up the story for you for just a moment. If you read through the book of Genesis, you will eventually come to the story of this boy named Joseph who is eventually sold into slavery by his brothers. 
that his brother, he is the favorite of his father, he is, the, he is the favorite of his dad, and the other brothers are jealous, and they are angry at him, and they don't like him because the dad shows him so much favor. And so eventually, these Egyptian, these, these people are coming by, and they eventually sell him into slavery. And they tell, make up this whole story that Joseph was murdered and he was killed and he was beaten up and the dad is sorrowful and Joseph is sold into slavery by his brothers and he later ends up in Egypt where because of his character and because of his hard work and because of he is and because of God's hand on his life, he eventually rises in power and kind of climbs the corporate ladder, so to speak, of the Egyptian government. And he finds himself eventually second in charge behind Pharaoh. That Pharaoh, the king of Egypt, basically, and then right underneath him is Joseph. And Joseph is in charge of all of Egypt. So this boy that was sold into slavery is now the second in charge of the most powerful kingdom in the world at this time. And eventually a famine comes and a famine strikes the, the land and not only in Egypt but also in the land of Canaan where Joseph and his family is from. And there's this huge famine to the point that everybody eventually comes to Egypt because Egypt is the only thing, the kingdom, Pharaoh's kingdom is the only one that has any food, has any money, and has anything. And Joseph is in charge of all of it. And eventually his brothers end up at his feet asking for food, begging for food. Like famine has come to our land, we don't know what to do. But here's the kicker. They don't realize that they're talking to their brother. They don't realize that Joseph has risen to power. And they're having this conversation and they're asking of this, not even a conversation, they're begging for food and Joseph realizes it's his brothers, but they don't realize it's him. And Joseph eventually grants their wish and he gives them all this food and he eventually tells them, which is the most, one, of the most best, or one of the best pictures of forgiveness in the scripture, Joseph says, hey, what you meant for harm, God meant for good because if God, you hadn't sold me into slavery, then I wouldn't be here and I wouldn't have been able to store up food to eventually help you out of the situation that you're in. So what you meant for harm, God meant for good, and here we are. And so Joseph goes back to Pharaoh and tells Pharaoh, hey, my family is here. My brothers are here. Can I take care of them? Pharaoh grants them permission. They go back. They get Joseph's dad. They bring them back. Joseph sets them up, and they are comfortably in the land of Goshen, and they are set up, and they are good to go for the rest of their lives because Joseph is now going to take care of them. And this is kind of where we're going to pick up in the story and the beginning of Exodus. This is Genesis coming to an end. Jacob, his father, passes away. Joseph, the very last chapter of Genesis, eventually passes away at the ripe age of 110, right? Woo. Passes away at 110, and we pick up in the story and the beginning of Exodus. And so let's look at Exodus chapter 1, starting in verse 6. And it says, Then Joseph died, and all his brothers, and all that generation. But the people of Israel were fruitful, and increased greatly. They multiplied and grew exceedingly strong, so that the land was filled with them. And now there arose a new king over Egypt who did not know Joseph. And he said to his people, Behold, the people of Israel are too many and too mighty for us. Come, let us deal truly with them, lest they multiply. And if war breaks out, they join our enemies and they fight against us and escape from the land. Therefore, they set taskmasters over them to afflict them with heavy burdens, and they built for Pharaoh's store cities, Pinnam and Ramses. But the more they were oppressed, the more that they multiplied, the more that they spread ab abroad. And the Egyptians were in dread of the people of Israel, and so they ruthlessly made the people of Israel work as slaves and made their lives bitter with hard service, in mortar and brick, and in all kinds of work in the field, and all their work they ruthlessly made them work as slaves. So in this story, Joseph has passed away, all of his brothers have passed away, and then all of a sudden the, the Joseph's legacy begins to kind of fade away. A new king rises in power in Egypt, and Joseph's, Joseph's legacy kind of wears off. For so long, the, the Israelites, the people that were there, Joseph's people, they continue to multiply, which is the promise of God that they would multiply and eventually be led to the promised land. But they continue to multiply, and they continue to multiply, and they've gotten comfortable where they're at. 
And they're living under the legacy of Joseph. And eventually Joseph and his brothers pass away. And a new king rises to power. And all he sees is a lot of Israelites that aren't his people. And he's a little concerned about them. And he's a little worried about them. And he gets a little bit like, well, if they rise up and join our enemies, they could overtake us. So we need to do something about this. Let's just lay a burden of slavery and a yoke on them. And let's just work them to death so that they understand who's in charge and what's happening. And so in the story, Joseph is sent to Egypt to temporarily help the children of Israel during the famine. But I don't believe that the point was for them to always stay there. Like when the famine was over, they could have gone back to Canaan. But they got comfortable where they were. They got comfortable living under the legacy of Joseph. They got comfortable being provided for. They got comfortable of having all that they wanted and everything that they needed. And so they get comfortable in Egypt and they get used to their new reality. And consequently, consequently they end up being slaves for over 400 years in the land of Egypt because at first they got comfortable and they accepted the new norm for their life and this is what they wanted and this is what they got comfortable with. And next thing you know, that leads to 400 years of slavery. Generation after generation after generation is in bondage and in debt and in slavery. And for us, it's the same way today. That we've bought into this lie that bondage and debt is the new norm. That bondage to credit cards and bondage to new car payments and bondage to student loans and bondage to a new house and bondage to a new couch and bondage to a new shirt and bondage to a new pair of shoes and bondage to this and bondage to that. We have bought into that's the norm. Well, I can't afford to pay for this, but I really need this, so I'm just going to go ahead and accept this credit card offer so that I can buy what I need, but then I'm going to pay it off as soon as I can. And then we never pay it off, and then the debt just piles up. Well, now I have this debt, but let me go get this. Well, I want to buy some new furniture and Rooms to Go is offering this deal, and so let me get this, and well, this person's offering that, and it's, it's 60 months, no financing or no interest, and so let me get this. And all of the thing you know, we've just accepted the new norm that whatever I want, whatever I need I can just go get it even if I don't have the money for it and we're just like the people in the story that we're talking about that we find ourselves in bondage and in debt and in slavery because we've just accepted the norm that it's okay and so this morning I, I've got a lot for you guys because I, I believe so much I told you last week I'm going to tell you today quite a few times that we're going through this series, and it's, it's not that fun to preach about money. It's not that fun to go through this. It's, it's the first time I've really led a whole series about giving and money and attitude and bondage as we're a new church. But it's crucial. And the reason why it's crucial is because I don't want something from you. I just want something for you. I want your attitude towards finances to be right. I don't want you to be in bondage. I don't, and then next week we're talking about the choice to, to be generous. I want this for your life. I don't want something from you. I want something for you. And so I have a lot for you this morning. And so lean in, tune in. Don't tune me out today. But I'm going to give you some realities of debt, and then I'm going to give you some ways to break the bondage of that. And so this morning, I want to talk to you first about the realities of debt. The first reality of debt is that debt obligates us to someone other than God. That debt obligates us to someone other than God. That when we owe someone something, we're obligated to them. If you come to me after service today and say, Pastor Kevin, hey, can I borrow 20 bucks and I'll pay you back next Sunday? I don't really care whether you pay me back or not. But if you tell me that you're going to pay me back, then you're kind of obligated to me to give me the money back. And so when we owe someone something, we're, we're obligated to them. I don't know if this works in your guys' lives or not, but it works in mine. Like, think about this. If, if someone calls you or someone texts you, I almost feel very obligated to get back to that person. And some of us are better at returning voicemails and phone calls than others, and some of us are horrible at it, right? But if you call me and leave me a voicemail or you call and send me a text message, like my rule of thumb is, man, I got to get back to you within like 24 hours at the most, most of the time, if you guys know those of you that text me, like I get back right away, like I'm, but I live on my phone, unfortunately. 
But if I can get back to you within 24 hours, or if I text you or I call you, man, I just feel like, man, you should get back to me within like 24 hours. Like that's just the right thing to do. And so I broke my own rule the other day. Somebody called me, and I wasn't obligated to them for anything. I didn't owe them anything. I didn't, they just called to check on me to see how I was. Someone I hadn't heard from in a couple years, a student from Southeastern that did an internship with us when we were at Fuel Church. His name was Zach, and he called me a couple weeks ago and said, Hey, Pastor Kevin, just wanted to check on you, see how the new church is doing, how's things going. And it got lost. Like, it got lost in my voicemail. It got lost in my mind with everything that I have going on. I didn't owe him something. He wasn't looking for something from me and I broke my own rule and I realized that two weeks had gone by and I hadn't text I hadn't called Zach back and I felt guilty like I called him and I almost just felt kind of as we say in our house ako taco right like kind of awkward a little bit like hey Zach this is Pastor Kevin sorry bro that I didn't call you back for two weeks I'm a loser Um, you know hope you're doing well right I almost felt bad but when, we, when, we're, when we're obligated to someone, when we owe someone something, we're obligated to them. And just like this voicemail, there's a window. Like if I had gotten back to Zach in a couple of days, it probably wouldn't have been as awkward, but two weeks had gone by, so it made it a little bit awkward. And so the first reality of debt is that debt obligates us to someone other than God. The second reality of debt is that debt is something that God wants us out of. The debt is something that God wants us out of. I mean, just plain and simple, being honest as I can possibly be with you this morning, I mean, just plain and simple, God wants us to be on a trajectory or a path of moving away from debt. God doesn't want you living in the debt and the bondage that many of us and many of the people that we know live in. He doesn't want that for your life. I believe truly with all that I am that God wants us to be a giving person and not just a taking person our entire life. And when we're under the bondage of debt and under the bondage of slavery, we cannot be as generous as we'd like to be. And I'm not just talking about being generous with your tithe or generous with what you give at church, but just generous in general to people that you talk to, people that you interact with, people at work that you may know need something, somebody that may need something for Thanksgiving and you wish that you could help them, but you don't have enough, you know, things like that. Just being a generous person. God wants us to be giving people and not just taking people our entire life. I've told you guys many times that I want our church to be known for our generosity, We don't need to be known for our worship. We don't need to be known for my preaching or we don't need to be known for things that the church does other than the fact that we're just generous with what we have, with our time and with our talents and what we give. Like, I just want to be known for our generosity. And so debt is something that God wants us out of so that we can be people of generosity. In Deuteronomy 28, you can write this down and read it later. I'm going to read it to you. But in Deuteronomy 28, Verses 12 through 14, it says this. The Lord will open to you his good treasury, the heavens, to give the rain to your land in its season and bless all the work of your hands. And you shall lend to many nations, but you shall not borrow, and the Lord will make you the head and not the tail. And you shall only go up and not down if you obey the commandments of the Lord your God. Which I command you today, be careful to do them. And if you do not turn aside from any of the words that I command you today, to the right hand or to the left, to go after other gods and to serve them. He says, hey, listen, I want you to be the head and not the tail. I want you to be a giver. I want you to be able to, that I'm going to rain down some things for you. I'm going to bless your land. I'm going to bless you. And I want you to be able to give and not just be a taker. I want you to be a person of generosity. I want you to lend to many nations, but not borrow. And then we're all going to interact people. We're all going to come across people in our lives that are takers, people that are always needing something. And maybe it's their circumstances. Maybe we help them. Maybe they, maybe they're, maybe they just do it to themselves, whatever it may be. But there's, there's going to be people in our lives that are takers. But ultimately God's plan for our lives is for us to be out of debt because it's something that he wants for us so that we can be people of generosity. The third reality of debt is that debt has the possibility of dictating our future. Debt has the possibility of dictating our future. When you're in bondage to someone, when you are in bondage to a debtor or to a creditor, I should say, 
then you're ultimately you're not free. And God desires for you to be free. And here's why I mean that you're not free. If you have a car payment this morning and you're making a car payment, don't make that car payment for three months and see what happens. They're going to come take your car and you're going to realize that there's no freedom in that. You're not free. You are a slave or in bondage to that debtor. And so ultimately, debt has the possibility of dictating our future because everything that we do, everything that we think, everything that we're working towards is towards making that next payment or how we're going to make that payment or how we're going to do this or how we're going to do that. It's not It's one of the realities of debt. The fourth reality of debt, and there's five this morning. The fourth one is that debt can affect our relationship with God, our family, and our marriage. Debt can affect our relationship with God, our family, and our marriage. Bondage to debt is subtle because typically we, we ask the wrong question. Look at any married couple in the room or if, if you've been married or you are married. Two of the biggest problems that married couples argue about the most that eventually could or could potentially lead to divorce is sex and money. And money causes more problems than anything else. And so if you're in a situation to where maybe you and your spouse or you and your significant other are not, not able to manage money the right way, maybe one of you thinks about it one way and one of you thinks it about the, the other. So often I use my own life as an illustration for you guys, but when Kim and I first got married, we thought about money differently. We couldn't even sit down and talk about, hey, what bills do we want to pay? Because I had my own way of wanting to work through it and my own little things that I like to do and whatever I like to do drove her crazy and whatever she liked to do drove me crazy. And every conversation would start out well, but it never ended well. Like we just got frustrated and we just never ended well until we eventually kind of figured out how to communicate with one another and what she needed from me and what I needed from her. And then we were able to kind of work our way into a conversation where we can sit down once a month or twice a month as she gets paid on the 15th and the end of the month and say, okay, hey, what are we doing? How are we doing this? How are we structuring this? What are we doing? And now we're able to do that. But it's taken us almost 20 years to get there, right? But it has an effect, uh, debt has this effect on our relationship, not only with God, but it has an effect on our family. Like if you've ever felt the pressure of being able to pay bills each and every month, and it could have an effect on your kids, it can have an effect on your family. Some of us are great about protecting our kids from certain things. Like Kim and I aren't, haven't always done a great job from protecting our girls from everything, but one of the things is if there were money problems or money issues, we've always protected them from that. My kids don't need to know that I can't pay the electric bill this month. We just need to figure it out. My kids don't need to know that, hey, the reason why we can't go to eat is because we're broke. We just need to say, hey, we're not making a decision to go out to eat tonight. We're just going to eat at home. And some of us are better at protecting our kids than others. But if, you're, if you've ever, just let the stress level in your house go up about anything and your kids feel it. And your kids react to it. Like just anything. Like either stress level in your house, even if they don't know, even if they're young, their kids can be three, two, even young, and they just feel the stress of their parents. So debt how it can affect our relationship with God. It can affect our relationship with our family. It can affect our relationship and our marriage. And the last reality of debt is that the Bible never condemns debt. The Bible never condemns debt. It just says that we need to have a trajectory to getting out of it. The Bible never condemns debt. It just says we need to have a trajectory to getting out of it. City so Place, hear my heart this morning. I've told you guys last week, I mentioned it already earlier today, that this series isn't about us wanting to free you up so that you have more that we, because we want something from you. This is us trying to free you up because we want something for you. We want you to not have to feel the pressure of this. We want you to have the right attitude. We want you to not be a slave or to be bonded to this. And, and not all debt is bad. That sometimes debt is necessary in order for you to get ahead temporarily. But it's not God's plan for you to stay there. And the problem is, is that many of us stay there. Many of us have the dream of owning our own house. Or maybe we own our own house. 
Most of us, if you own a house, you probably have a mortgage because if you had to save up $250,000 to go buy a new house, the the bet is you probably would never save up $250,000 to just go pay cash for a house. Many of us, they saved up for a car. You need a new car, but do we have to get a 60-month financing loan? Can we just do 24 months and get a car that's a little bit cheaper? Like, God, God, it's, debt is okay in a season, but God doesn't want us ultimately to stay there. The problem is, is that most of our mindsets is like, well, it's just the norm. Like, my car payment, I should always have a car payment. No, you shouldn't, right? I should always have a couple credit cards. No, you don't have to. I mean, some people are great. Like, they get a credit card, they run stuff up, they pay it off that month, and it's good, right? Others of us like, well, I was going to do that, but I didn't. And then the next month I didn't, and the next month I didn't, and the next month I didn't, and the next thing you know, you're paying, you know, for 40 years on a credit card. And so not all debt is bad, but some debt's useful for us to get, a whole, get ahead. And the story that we looked at in Exodus, the children of Israel, God used Egypt for them in that moment to feed them. God used Joseph and the famine and what was happening in that moment. He took care of them, and they were in debt to that for a little bit. They were to stay there and work, but they didn't have to stay long term, and they did. And the next thing you know, it led to them to bondage and slavery for over 400 years. And so now I want to give you a couple bondage breakers. Bondage breakers. The first bondage breaker is that we need to commit to God to get out of debt. Commit to God to get out of debt. That when we make a commitment to God to get out of debt, it takes us from the borrower category to the lender category. We move from taker to giver. We get to being a lender and a giver is way better than being a taker and a borrower. And so if we make this commitment to to get out of debt, if we make this commitment to God to get out of debt, I don't know about you, and I haven't always kept all of my promises that I may have made. And a few weeks ago, I told you guys about promise, and then there's pinky promise, right, which takes the promise to a whole new level. I haven't always kept all of my promises, and I wish that I could say that I did. But if I made a commitment to God, if I made a promise to God that, hey, I'm going to get out of this, that's one person I probably don't want to break my promise to. That God desires for us, as we read in the scripture in Deuteronomy, that he wants us to be the head and not to tell. That we can be free from debt. We just have to make the commitment to God to get out of it. Romans 13.8 says, Let no debt remain outstanding except the continuing debt to love one another from whoever loves others has fulfilled the law. The second bondage breaker is don't acquire any more debt. So we're going to make a commitment to God to get out of debt. The second bondage breaker is that we're not going to acquire any more debt. You'll never get out of a hole that you keep digging, right? So if I'm standing in a hole with a shovel in my hand and I'm like, eventually I'm going to get out of this hole. If I just keep digging, eventually something's going to happen. And the more that I dig, the deeper I go. So you're never going to get out of a hole that you continue to dig. And so the second bondage breaker is for us not to acquire any more debt. The third bondage breaker is for us to put God first in our finances. Nobody, nobody who ever put God first in their finances has ever felt like God let them down. I promise you that. Anyone who has put God first in their finances has never felt like God has ever let them down. We can't get to the financial picture, to that sunset that we showed you last week, which is ultimately where I would hope all of us would want to be. None of us would want to live in the tornado or the cloudy day. I would much rather, even though I don't like the beach, be on a sunset, right, than in a tornado. We're never going to get to the financial picture that we want without including God in the process. And just like we talked about last week, he owns it all anyways. Remember, everything that we have is just on loan from God, everything. And so he owns it all anyways. But putting God first in your finances can be difficult. Like many of us have the mindset of, well, I'm going to do what I can, or I'll give what I can, and I'll I'll do whatever I can, but i got all these things to do. God's not first in your finances. When God's first in your finances, I promise you, he will never let you down. When Kim and I first started going to church and I was brand new to church and she had been in church 
pretty much her whole life. And we got to church and we're, uh, we're there. And I'm a brand new Christian. It's like 14 years ago. And she's like, hey, we got to start tithing. I'm like, what does that mean? And she's like, that means we got to give money to the church. I'm like, what? I ain't giving no money to the church, right? I mean, I'm working. You work, I work. We make good money. Like, I'm keeping my money. What are you talking about? She's like, no, it says that we should give a certain percentage of our money to the church. And I'm like, you're crazy. That is not happening, right? Eventually it happened, of course. But he was like, no, this is what we're supposed to do. This is what we're going to do. And even though there's times that it's tough and we give whatever percentage we give and we, we do what we do and we tithe the city place and we give to city place and sometimes it's tight and we're not sure how things are going to happen, but God always shows up, right? I might get a speaking engagement to go speak at someone's church for them and they give me a, they give me a love gift for being there. A, a check may show up in the mail from this person or a check may show up from that person or this person blesses us this way or this person blesses us that way. Whatever it is, we put God first in our finances. I promise you, he will never, ever, ever, ever let you down. Ever. And bad things may happen at first because it's a process, Right? You ever not worked out for a really long time and then go to the gym and the first three weeks is miserable because you are so sore. Because you haven't lifted weights in a really long time and then now you're lifting and you're sore and you're like, what's the, man, this hurts and my arms hurt, my chest hurts, my legs hurt and I don't really want to do this or I just started running or I just started walking and my body's sore and for about two or three weeks it just hurts. And then eventually like you see yourself in the mirror and you see a little bit of a result and you're like, oh, wait, you know, right? And you're like, and nobody hopes nobody sees you, right? Flexing in the mirror. But after a couple of weeks, you're like, man, there's a difference. Like, this is good. Like, okay, now I want to go to the gym because now I'm starting to see the difference. When we put God first in our finances, it's the same way. He may take you through a portion. He may take you through a season where it's tough. He may take you through a season where it's difficult, but eventually he's going to see you out of it. And in the end, things are going to go crazy and God's going to bless you with it. I promise. The fourth bondage breaker is that we have to develop a written plan. We have to develop a written plan. Last week, we told you guys that we had books out that we were going to give these books away. The ABCs of Financial Freedom, what this whole series is based off of. And there's some books out on the connections table. Take one per family. Take it. If we run out and we don't get some, let us know and I'll order some more. But we want to give you guys the books because in the book, there's a plan that helps you do the things that we're talking about. Talks about your attitude, talks about bondage, talks about the choice. We want to give you the written plan. We want to help you the best way that we can, which is why we're giving the books away for free. What gets measured gets repeated. What gets celebrated gets repeated. And so you've got to have a written plan. You ever put something down and then achieve that goal and then you're like, "Woo! like this is good, like I did it. Like I achieved my goal, I did what I needed to do, like I had a plan and it happened and, and so what gets measured gets repeated. Like you gotta have a goal to shoot for, you gotta have something, right? I'm a goal-oriented person. Like I want great things for our church, I want great things for me and for my marriage and my kids, but if I don't have goals in mind, like I'm never going to get there. I'm a goal-minded person because... I, I want to see process. I want to see the process, or not process, but progress of what's happening. And so we've got to have a, a, develop a written plan. There's this thing, and many of you may have heard of it before, it's called the debt snowball, where you go from the smallest to the largest, and it works. Like, you take your lowest amount, like, say you got a credit card that you owe 500 bucks on, and your minimum payment is 300 or $330, sorry, 30 bucks. You pay that credit card off as fast as you can, then you take that 30 bucks and you add it to the next credit card or the next bill and you pay that one off and then you take that 50 or 60, 70, 80 bucks and you add it to the next one and 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 to the next one So eventually you're debt free. So eventually, like if we were to do that and we got down to our largest debt that Kim and I have is my student loans, if we were to get to a point where we took all of the other stuff that we had and we were to add that all into a payment and make a payment of six, seven, eight hundred dollars a month to my student loans, they'd be paid off a lot faster than me paying 250 bucks a month. And you have this debt snowball. So you got to have a plan. You got to know where you're going. We want you to have the right attitude. We want you to be out of bondage, but you got to have a plan. The fifth bondage breaker is to put it on a time frame. Put it on a time frame. The book's going to help you do that. The book is going to help you establish some timelines. Because here's what we know. And this is true about anything in life. 
not just this, but anything in life, that when you can see the finish line, it'll boost your morale. Like if you've ever been an athlete and you've ever been in a race and you're running, regardless of whether it's a 100-yard dash or maybe a marathon, and you're running it and you see the finish line at the end, it boosts your morale a little bit. It helps you get through. Like, man, I'm tired, I'm exhausted, I've been running or I've been doing this, but all of a sudden I see the finish line and now there's a boost because you're almost done and you just push through to the finish line. It can be that way about anything. It just doesn't have to be a sport per se, but ever work towards a goal. Man, I want to graduate college and you get close to college and the thing that keeps you motivated is the finish line. You got a project that you're working on and you're almost done and the finish line is right there. When you get close to the end of that, you push through. Like seeing the finish line boosts your morale. And so we got to have a time frame. Man, in the next 90 days, I want to have this paid off. Or in the next six months, I want to have this paid off. In the next six months, I want to have this paid off. And we just kind of add this to our cycle so that we have things on a time frame. But remember that what took, you year, what took you years to get into won't be fixed overnight. The hole that we talked about earlier, that you know we just keep digging and digging and digging and digging, it's taken a long time to dig that hole. You're not just going to jump out of it overnight. But you've got to have a plan. You've got to put it on a time frame. And we've got to work towards the freedom that God ultimately desires in our life. And the last bondage breaker is this, that we adjust our lifestyle. Adjust your lifestyle. I asked you last week this idea, what are you willing to go without so that you can live in freedom? What are you willing to go without so that you can live in freedom? That if we're going to break the bondage in our lives of debt, that eventually we're going to have to say no to some things so that we can say yes to some things later. And so what as a church, what is as a body of Christ, what if we were willing to commit to this? What could City Place look like or what could your life look like and what could City Place look like if all of us were debt free except for maybe our housing and our living expenses, if we all had extra income to be generous with, how different would our church look? Not because we would have great things here, but just the word on the street about, hey man, this lady that goes to city place just blessed me with this or this just happened that god desires for us to be givers and not just takers and isn't it better if you've ever had the opportunity to give don't you feel better about yourself when you give than when you take and sometimes we're in situations where we need help and i'm not saying if you're in that situation that's what our church is for. It's why we have benevolence. It's why we help people as much as we can with rent and electric and groceries. And we understand that there's circumstances that hurt people's lives where you need help. But many of us would never ask for help. Many of us would never say, Pastor Kevin, I don't, I don't know if there's any way the church can help me, but like if I don't pay my electric bill by Friday, my power is going to get turned off and I, I don't know what to do. Many of us wouldn't come. Like, I want you to know, hear my heart, the church has money set aside to help you if you're in that situation. Now, we can't help you every month, but we can help you. But many of us wouldn't come and ask to do that. But man, you get the opportunity to be a giver, and it just does something inside of you. Or someone gives you something, and, and right? You guys know, I'm going to share the story with you really quick. We got this building project we're working on and this building that we're moving to and, and where we're leading and, and God's doing some stuff and I'm not the best fundraiser on the planet. I've learned that over the course of the last two years. It's just not my gift. I got other pastor friends that can sneeze and money falls in their pockets, right? It's not my gift. I love sharing my heart. I love sharing my vision for where I think City Place is headed and what God has for us, but to ask you specifically for money, it's just not my heart. And so a business friend of mine in town that I met with earlier in the year before the building was even an option for us and we were talking and he said, man, listen, if I can ever do anything for you guys, if I can ever help your church in any way, I, I, I go to a different church, but I just love City Place. I love what you guys are about. I love how you guys want to be generous, how you serve so much. You do so much for the school and so much for the community. So maybe by the end of the year, maybe with some rental properties I have and some things, maybe I'll be able to to do something for you guys. And I'm like, okay, man, that would be great if you can. You know, if you can't, no, whatever. You know, I never followed back up with the guy. 
two weeks ago, he texts me and says, hey man, can we grab lunch on Friday the, what, if, what was Friday, the 17th? Can we grab lunch on Friday the 17th? And I'm like, sure. And I just thought he wanted to get together and catch up and whatever. And so we sit down at Crispers in downtown and he's like, tell me what's going on with the church. And I'm like, oh man, it's so amazing. I haven't talked to you in like 10 months. Let me tell you everything God's doing. He gave us this opportunity for this building and I'm trying to raise money and I'm trying to do this stuff. And we got this thing and the community around us is excited about us coming and our church is excited and we're going to have our own space and it's going to be awesome and all these cool things. And this has happened and that's happened and God moved this way and God moved that way. And we've had people give their life to Christ and baptizing people. It's like, it's been really cool, man. It's been so awesome. What's going on with you? He's like, hold on, let's go back to the city place real quick. I'm like, oh, okay. He goes, now I know why. I'm like, what are you talking about? And he goes, two weeks ago, God placed you on my heart. Two weeks ago, God told me that I needed to give some money to city place, and I had no idea why, but now I know why. Because you're in the middle of this building program and what you're doing. And so, bro, it's not much, um, but here's a check for me and my wife. And he slides this check across the table, right? It's a check for a thousand bucks. And I'm, I, he's like, it's a check for $1,000 and, and it's for your building and do what you need to do with it. And I open the check and I'm like, bro, are you kidding me right now? And he's like, no. And he goes, I know it's not much. I go, are you kidding me right now? Like, we need 50000 bucks. Like, that's what I think we need to raise. And now I only got to raise 49000 instead of 50000 And it sounds better to say forty nine than fifty. And if I can get 49 more of you to do this, we're good, bro. We're good. And just he started smiling on the end. Like, you could just tell. And he was so happy to be able to just give. He had no idea why he was giving. He just, it's what God desires for our lives. Like God wants us to do that. But when we live in the bondage of slavery, we're not able to do that. The bondage of debt, we're not able to do that. I've told you for two weeks, it's my bottom line, my closing thought for the day is that we don't want something from you. Instead, we want something for you. And so the challenge on the table this morning is this. Would you make the commitment today? Would you make the commitment to say, hey, I'm going to grab the book, and I promise you, if we run out, I'll order some more, and we'll get them here ASAP for you. Would you make the commitment to read the book? Would you make the commitment to make a change in your finances? Regardless of what financial picture you're in, whether you're the sunset or the tornado or anywhere in between, would you make the commitment to do that? Because God desires for us to be people of generosity. God desires for us to not be in debt long term. And so many of us, me included, have just accepted the idea that it's the norm. So we're making changes in our lives. We're making changes in our finances based on this. I'm praying that you will as well. And we look from a year from now and see what's happening and what God does and what God's doing in your life and in the life of our church. Man, look out. It's going to be great. And so this morning, I want to ask you to close your eyes and bow your heads for me for just a moment.